Hey guys, if you're like me and live on a homestead, you've got one of these. This is a deep water well and mine is not working right now. I looked on YouTube to see if there was any good troubleshooting videos and there was either some that were too technical or some that were too intermediate. I'm gonna go through the troubleshooting procedures start to finish to help you get your well back up and running. So this is a horse and a half well and we have this, which is the pressure switch. This is really an odd pressure switch in that you actually have to jump start it to get it to run. The pump will turn on at 30 PSI and turn off at 50 PSI. A lot of them that I've seen don't have this on parameter. They're just gonna shut off when they reach a certain PSI, in this case, 50. Now that's kind of a neat idea on this because if you were to have a major break in the line or if your well was running dry, this will actually take and keep that pump safe. Regardless, all of these are gonna function about the same. Now, if you loosen the top screw on here, before you do that though, Go into your breaker box and make sure that you flip the breaker off. And then I always take it a step further. Once I get that breaker flipped off, I'm going to pop this lid off and I'm going to take and put a meter across the connections that are coming from that breaker. So if I look here, I know that this and this, the two outside are what's coming in. So I'm going to take a meter and I'm going to test across that before I start touching anything and before I get into this box here. So let's grab a meter and we're gonna take and test the voltage on that. All right, so I'm back. I'm gonna put my meter on AC volts and then I'm gonna jump across these two connections right here. And I do not have any voltage. I'm not sure if you can see the meter. And if I jump across these two, just to be on the safe side, zero voltage, zero voltage, so I have no voltage across any of this. So I'm good to take and start touching those. Now the very first thing that you can try is making sure that this is going to energize. This particular one I can energize with this switch here. And what happened on this is when I energize it, it would pop the breaker underneath here. So again, I know that I have no voltage. So I'm gonna take, take this cover off. Now inside these covers here, they give you a very good wiring diagram and they will tell you some of the resistances and ohm ratings and amperages that you're gonna find on the motor and across the relay. So one of the first things that I'm gonna test, I'm gonna put it on voltage. Now if your meter has a range, you're probably gonna want it on the high voltage side. So I'm gonna flip the breaker on. So my breaker is turned on and I'm gonna test across my incoming line. So if I look, I've got 248 volts across the incoming line. And then if I switch to the two internal terminals, which are what runs out to the controller, I do not have any voltage right now. I'm gonna take a screwdriver that's very well insulated and I'm going to push in this contactor. And if you look on my meter, I have 244 volts. So that tells me that I'm getting voltage out of the pressure controller into the relay box. The next thing I'm gonna do is test from the pressure switch to the control box. Now in this case, I have L1 and L2, which is line one, line two. So I'm gonna put my meter across line one and line two, and I should not have any voltage. And then if I take and trip this again, I actually have, again, 240 volts right there. So that means that I'm getting voltage to my control box and everything up to it is fine. More than likely, it's going to be the relay or one of the capacitors that are within the box. Now you have a start capacitor and you have a run capacitor in these boxes. And then you have the control relay. What this relay does is once it gets voltage, it jumps these capacitors to that motor to give it a good surge of power to start it and then you have your run capacitor, which is always connected. So if you have verified that your breaker on the bottom is pushed in and good, there, it's gonna, when you push it, it's gonna have a good hard snap to it. If you verify that it is not tripped and your motor's still not running, the next thing that I would recommend doing is testing the ohm rating across the connections of your motor. Now, before you do that, we're gonna take and we're gonna pop this breaker off. And then in order to get accurate readings, you really need to disconnect them 
from your control box. All right, verify again that my breaker is off. If you want to be extra safe, you can go in here, test across, make sure you have no voltage. In my case, I do not. All right, so I'm going to disconnect these lines that come from the actual motor itself. You don't need to worry about the green. That's the ground. So I'm going to disconnect the yellow, the red, and the black. Most of the control boxes are going to tell you what the winding resistant ohms are on your motor. Now there's going to be a range that they'll work with. So the red to yellow is between 8.0 and 9.7 ohms. The black and yellow is 1.7 to 2.2 ohms. And then the red and black is 9.7 to 11.9 ohms. I'll zoom in a little on that. All right, so on your meter, you're gonna to go to ohms. And this particular one is right up here. And you can see that I have the little ohm symbol. If you're unfamiliar with that, it kind of looks like a horseshoe. So the first reading that I'm gonna test is between the red and yellow. So I'll put one lead on the red and one lead across the yellow. All right, so I got 8.9 across that. Again, the tolerances within that are 8 to 9.7. So I'm within tolerance between the red and the yellow. Next, I'm going to go between the black and the yellow. Yellow and black. That one is about 2.1. Yep. Reading 2.1 on that, and the tolerances between that one are 1.7 and 2.2. So again, I'm within tolerance. Next, red and black. So if we go red and black. I'm right at 11 on that. My tolerances within that are 9.7 to 11.9. So that tells me that the motor is fine. All of the windings are fine. They read within the spec of what this controller wants. That's a good thing because your pump is the most expensive part of your well, besides actually doing the drilling and everything. So next we're going to move on and test the capacitors on this. The easiest way to do that is to take a lot of pictures of the wiring and just remove them, take them out, and then we'll test them. I'm actually gonna test them on the tailgate of the truck. Give me a couple minutes, I'm gonna loosen this and I'm gonna take these capacitors out and document where all of the wiring goes. However, in my case, this control box has a great wiring diagram, so it'll be easy for me to put it back together. So I'm gonna take these two capacitors out and I'll meet you back on the tailgate of the truck where we'll bring the meter and we'll test the microfarads of these capacitors. Hey guys, just a quick safety update here. Do not touch the terminals on the capacitor. Take a screwdriver or some pliers and short it out first. All right, I'm back and I have removed the capacitors. In this case, this one is a 10 microfarad. You can see right here that 10.0 and the little UF. That's telling me that it's 10 microfarad and then it's got a plus or eight, 6%. 370 volts AC. Those are important to remember, but the main thing that we need today is the 10 microfarad. So on my meter, this particular meter does read microfarads. So if you don't have a meter that has some microfarads on it, I'd suggest getting one. Uh, they're going to come in very handy around your homestead for testing capacitors on motors, air conditionings, wells, things like that. So the, they're not very expensive at all. And this particular one, it's on the same setting as the ohms are. So I'm going to take and push the mode button a couple of times until I get to this one. It has NF, but that is the whole microfarad range and all. So in order to test for microfarads, 
So you're going to go across both terminals of that capacitor. You're going to give it a couple of seconds and it's going to give you a reading. In this case, it's 9.89. 9 so that's telling me, and you, I don't know if you can see on that, the little UF up at the top. So this is 9.89 microfarads. So this capacitor is supposed to be 10 microfarads. That tells me that this capacitor is good. This capacitor here is the actual start capacitor and it is between 124 and 149 microfarads. Now this one has a little resistor that's across it. I'm not quite sure. It doesn't show that in the diagram. So I'm gonna remove that just to make sure that I get an accurate reading. So I removed one of the terminals on that, as you can see. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna go across both of the terminals. And you can see that it's working on a reading now. So that's telling me it's 130. Again, you can see the little microfarad, the UF symbol up at the top. So I'm at 130.3 right now on the microfarads of this capacitor. And so that's with inspect. So that means that this capacitor is good as well. So the next thing we're gonna do is test this resistor that's on here. I'm going to go across the leads of the resistor and test it. In this case, it's reading nothing. So I'm going to change the scale on this. And once I do that, this is telling me that it's 15, basically, basically 15 K. If you look up at the very top there, you'll see the little K. So 15 K is what the resistor here is reading. Now, if I look on this resistor, the resistor has a color code. And this particular one is brown, green, black, and orange. And then there's a space here and I go to brown. So that space tells me the direction that these are gonna read. And that brown one is really not important for us. That brown one is the tolerance of the resistor. It will make a little bit of a difference because it'll tell you, you know, within what range that's gonna be. So let's see if that is actually a 15K resistor. You can find different charts online. I actually just pulled up resistor color code and this is a, I guess it's a plaque that they have on Amazon. And this resistor has five bands on it. And it's gonna tell me that the first digit is brown. So that's a one. The second digit is green. So that's a five. The third digit is actually going to be the multiplier on a five band one. So the third digit is the multiplier and it is orange. So that is times 1K. So 15. So that tells me that this is a 15K resistor. And that last one is the brown, meaning 1%. So if I was within 1% of 15K, I would be fine with this. So that tells me that that resistor is good as well. So I'm gonna put that back like it was. I'm gonna reinstall these caps. And the only thing that's really left is going to be the relay. What the relay does is when the pressure switch calls for water, it trips and it allows a start relay to give a surge of electricity to that motor so that it can start spinning. If you're not familiar with what a capacitor is, it's like a large battery that can discharge a huge amount of current all at once. And that will get that motor to where it'll start spinning. If your capacitors are bad, more than likely what's gonna happen is it's gonna pop breakers, which is what this is doing. Since I know the capacitors are good and I'm still tripping the breaker on this, that tells me that it's the relay. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace that relay. This relay is kind of a pain to get to the screw on there's like no way to easily get to it with the way that all this is set up um, all right i built me a little rig to kind of try to get in there because i make it where 
is hard to access. So that's the relay right there. You'll notice, I'm not sure if you can see that, that it has one, two, and three, and it's labeled one, two, and in this case, it's actually labeled five. Now, I went ahead and bought a replacement relay, which I've got right here. You can see that it's got the same wiring diagram as what the other one did. One, two, and five. So let's get this hooked up. So we'll get that wiggled around up in there. Take this relay. Get everything lined up. So look at the wiring diagram on this model. This tells me that number one comes out and it hits the start capacitor, which is this black one here. And then it comes from the start capacitor, it goes into the run capacitor. So we'll go ahead and hook that black up as a jumper. And then the orange wire comes from the relay and goes into the start capacitor. So we're gonna hook that up like that. I'm going to go ahead and take these capacitors and put them back in place here. We're going to take the orange lead, we're going to connect it to number one. Okay, we're going to come out of the run capacitor, and that's the black that goes to this overload breaker. So we'll hook it into that there. And we've got this red line, which goes to number two on the relay, which is gonna be the bottom. And then we've got the yellow, which is going to go to number five. Just like that. And then let's go ahead and get our Pump wires reconnected. I'm gonna put red to red, yellow to yellow, black to black. Grab my flathead screwdriver and we're gonna snug these down. So we got one more line that we need to connect. I've actually got these backwards. This red needs to go here. And this red is going to go to the other side of the capacitor. And that black's going to go there. So to kind of verify what we've got, we're coming out of the relay. Number one is the orange, and we're going into this big capacitor, the start capacitor. We come out of that start capacitor with a black line, which is right here, and we go into the run capacitor right here. We come out of that run capacitor, the black line goes to the overload. So if we follow that one down, yep, we're into the overload. And then the other side of that capacitor is the red line right here that goes into the red of the motor. Number two on that relay is the red line that also connects into here, which if I follow it, it does. And then the yellow that goes to the relay, which is this one right here, it comes around and it connects into the yellow of the pump. I'll take and hold that up. You guys can verify that I'm correct. If it looks good, let's go ahead and turn the breaker on. Let's make sure that this is reset. We're gonna turn the breaker on. We haven't popped anything yet. 
And like I was saying earlier, with this, you have to put it into a start position. And let's see if we can kick the well on. There we go. Awesome. This one, I have to hold it for a little while. So it's working like it should right now. So once that gets to around 50 PSI, it should shut off. So to kind of recap on this, test your voltage here first. In my case, the outside leads were the ones that came from the relay, and then the inside leads were the ones that came out and went up to my control box. From there, we made sure that this was energized and we had voltage across this line. We tested against L1 and L2 to make sure that we had voltage, which we did. The next thing that we did was we disconnected the motor and we tested the resistance across the different wires and we compared that to what our box told us that we should have. In this case, all of those wires ohmed out correctly within spec. The next thing that we did, we removed the capacitors from the box and tested the microfarad ratings on those and those tested fine. In this case, we had a resistor that jumped across the start capacitor. We tested the ohm rating on that and compared it to a chart and it was within tolerance as it should have been. So the next thing that we did, I just assumed that that was bad and it was. I was able to pick that relay up off of Amazon. I wanna say it was under $20 and I got it here in two days. So right now, if we look at our pressure, we're building pressure like we're supposed to and this thing should kick off in just a second. There we go. Well, thanks for staying and watching the whole video. I'm glad I was able to get my well up and running and I hope this video helps you get yours up and running if you have a problem. If you haven't had a problem and are just watching this video, be sure to bookmark it in case you do have an issue with your well in the future because these troubleshooting tips, as you saw, will get your well back up and running in no time for very little cost. You don't have to hire somebody to come out and take a look at it. They're gonna charge you for a road trip and all that. Take a look at your well, figure out what components that you need and keep them in stock. That way you're not down for days and you can get back up and running in no time. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel. I've got lots of other DIY tips coming up in the near future and I appreciate you watching. Thanks. A quick update. I took the relay apart, take a look at it. It's obviously been arcing inside there. I think the reason that the well worked when I did this video was it had been able to make a good connection in between there. But uh, anyway, we've got it replaced and the well's been working fine.